Good afternoon. It's the second to last talk, and I think it's been a great first day of talks. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker. His name is Lewis Franklin, and he will be talking about distributed computing is hard. Let's go shopping. All right, thanks everyone for coming. Just go ahead and dive right in. First off, who am I, and more importantly, why should you listen? I've been developing in Python for 10 years. I've been using Celery for two years. I've released a couple of projects out there, one called Celery Mutex. It allows you to have a mutex on Celery to ensure it only executes once. And also working on another project called ZK Celery that basically just takes a lot of the stuff that I'll even talk about today and puts it into one library to make it easy to merge Zookeeper and Celery, because I think Zookeeper is a great tool for doing distributed computing and handling what you need to do. Also, I screwed up with Celery. A lot. So why am I here? I think distributed computing is awesome. Just the power that it unleashes for you just makes my job easier in some ways and harder than others, but it just, it's a puzzle that I love to solve. And whenever I came to PyCon last year, there just wasn't enough talks about distributed computing, especially outside of the web. A lot of people were talking about using Django and just spawning off stuff to get things done, but not really talking about long-running tasks, IO-intensive tasks. So I realized, how do I solve that problem? By trying to speak. And so I wanted to focus on Celery outside of the web, and I wanted others to avoid some of the pitfalls that I've made. So where are we going? This talk is about distributed computing. I focus on Celery because it's what I know. But I know it's not the only game in town. This talk does assume, at times, you know Celery. If you don't, please stick around. You still may learn something. And I'd love to talk to you about Celery. It's something I've gotten really into, really enjoy, and think it's a great tool. So let's just start with a basic introduction of what is Celery. So we're all on the same page with where we're going. If you go to the celeryproject.com, they give you this quote. Celery is an asynchronous task queue slash job queue based on distributed message passing. It is focused on real-time operation, but supports scheduling as well. Let's unpack that a little bit. Celery allows you to use Python with a message broker, such as RabbitMQ or Redis, and you build tasks that then can be run locally or across a group of computers that can communicate with this message broker. Tasks can be reactive, you call them, or scheduled using Celery Beat. So why are you here? You're here to learn from my mistakes, so let's talk about overcoming obstacles and problems encountered and personal solutions. Before I go too much into distributed computing, I have to bring up the fallacies of distributed computing from Peter Deutsch. He was working at Sun and came up with these seven fallacies that people make whenever they're working on distributed computing. I think it's important just to step through each one of those to remind ourselves of the, easy, the mistakes that are easy to make. I keep a copy of this in my office just as a reminder, and even still I make mistakes and still forget stuff some, from time to time, but it's important to remember the foundation that we come from. First, the network is reliable. How many times have we assumed that we'll be able to reach our database, that we'll be able to reach an NFS, that we'll be able to reach a web service? That latency is zero. Yeah, I can communicate between com two computers instantaneously. So what if one is in Asia and one is in America? Bandwidth is infinite. Let's take a one gigabyte file and shuffle it over the pipes, because it'll happen instantaneously. The network is secure. No one can hack into our system and cause me problems. The topology doesn't change. We're not going to have any changing environment. We're not going to have different computers. We're not going to have different switches. We're also not going to have <clears throat> the problem of this group of computers interacts differently than this group of computers. There's only one administrator. So when I talked to my administrator and got my server fixed, no one else is going to log on to that computer and do any other changes. Had this one bite me today. I'm sitting in a meeting, and I got an email from one of our administrators that, oh, I deleted the home directories on a server. Was that a problem? Yes, yes it was. But that's the beauty of distributed computing. I told them I'll get back to it later because it was just one of my computers. And lastly, that transport cost is zero. That taking a file, encrypting it, and sending it across will be instantaneous. So first, let's talk about KISS. No, I'm not talking about the ban. Just keep it simple, stupid. Or keep it short and simple, keep it short and sweet. But these are just some of the low-hanging fruit that we can grab to be able to quickly get going on distributed computing. First, memory management. This section does 
talk about some stuff that we need in distributed computing, but it's a problem you have just any time you're working. But as soon as you start spinning up additional processes on your computer, memory becomes an even bigger problem. So I, in my job, we deal with automotive data. We take data on the sales of vehicles, present that into, do a lot of analytics, and present that to car dealerships. Yes, I do work for car dealerships. I'm sorry. It is insane the amount of data that they record on every single car deal. For one car deal, there can be five to 700 different data points that they track from what kind of make, model, stuff was installed, what kind of APR did you get, how much did it sell for, how much profit was made. I could go on and on. So we get these multiple gigabyte files, and how do I deal with that? You have to understand the consequence to every call when you're interacting with this large data. Am I taking a two gigabyte file and loading it completely into RAM and then trying to do some processing on it? The simple thing to do is remember to utilize generators and iterators as much as possible. Two big ones that I've learned from, if you're using XML, etree.iterparse versus etree.parse can make a huge difference. We'll look at an example, but just to put it in perspective, I had a two gigabyte file that if I just tried to do parse, loaded all two, gigab two gigabytes into RAM. Whenever I used iter parse, that pushed it down to 10 to 15 megabytes. So you can make a big savings just by taking advantage of those tools. If you use the request library, instead of just doing r.content to get all the content from the website, do r.iter content, and you can chunk it either by um, byte size or you can do iter lines to go over lines. So here's an example of an XML document I get. Vehicle sale, it's got root, and then the first is vehicle sales. And then vehicle sales says this is one cell. And then they just do a key value pair. Yes, it looks just like CSV. Yes, it's 10 times more verbose than a CSV would be. But I have to deal with the data that I'm given. So once I know the structure, I can parse over that iteratively. So here's the code how I read that and load one vehicle sale at a time into the database. It's a little overwhelming, but I'm going to break it down. First, I just say that I want to look at the start and end event. Whenever I get to a start of an XML tag or an end of X XML tag, let me know. So I iterate over the tree. And every time it comes to the start or an end, it lets me know. I go ahead and grab the name for the tag. If it's a start, I know that I've moved up a level in the XML, so I just increase my level by one. I don't care about the root tag, so I don't care about zero. And I don't care as much about one. I just want to know when I've got through with one. So the first thing I do is when I get to my second level and I'm at the end, so I know I've got a full read of that, that uh, element, I go ahead and get the text and save it into a dictionary. When I move back down to level one and it's at the end, I take that dictionary that's got all of my key value pairs, write it to the database, and reset my dictionary. And then whenever I get to the end of any element, I go ahead and run clear, and that flushes it out of memory. So this is one way that you can make sure you save memory as you're doing your processing. Data locality. It's easy to forget where your data is. One of the first tasks I ever wrote was I had a task that would build a file from the database and then would stack them up, and then another process would do it every 10 minutes and send those to third-party clients. So I call this one file, two tasks. When I first wrote it, it was working great on my local machine. And then I sent it out to my distributed computing. So I had a bunch of servers working, and I was getting errors left and right. I didn't understand what was going on. Stupid, simple mistake. I was saving the file locally. So the process that built the file was on server A. The process that tried to send it was on server B. So just know where your data is. But keep in mind also that closer is better. Know that working in memory is faster than working with a local file system. And the local file system is faster than NAS. And that is still faster than Carrier Pigeon. If you're using Carrier Pigeon, we might want to have a talk. Find that balance between speed and accessibility of your data. Segregation, segregation of duties. First off, utilize multiple queues to keep them separated so you can divide up your task. And here's a little picture to kind of help illustrate this problem. If you've got just one big fat queue on RabbitMQ, and it's got 10, 20, 40, 50 jobs of one type that just keeps firing off really fast, and you've got job B way back at the end, and you're only using one queue, it's just going to be sitting there waiting for a long time until that task ever gets actually executed. The opposite side is an idle queue is the devil's playground. So you could have one queue that's just overwhelmed, it's got 400 items, and then the rest of them just have zero, one, two, three. Experience today a great example of this. After one of the, tax, uh, one of the talks, I needed to go to the bathroom. 
And there were a bunch of people in the bathroom right afterwards. And then once I start going to work on my speaker slides, all the speakers are on the fourth floor, and there are these gigantic bathrooms, and no one's in them. So here's a wasted resource that's just sitting there doing nothing, wherever we've got other resources, fifth floor bathrooms, that are getting overwhelmed. And so that's just an easy way to remember, you know, if you segregate too much, you could really be wasting your resources. So it's just important to find that balance between a fine-grained queues and resource utilization. Because every one of those workers that you've got sitting on a queue is taking up memory. It is having to listen to the queue for any response. So it's taking up resources. And if you know that you can handle so many jobs across your queue, so if all six of those queues are working at the same time, and they've got four threads at a time, you could be doing 24 jobs at a time. But if you're not balancing that right, you could have that one doing four jobs while you have others just sitting idly. With Stellar, you can take advantage of auto-scaling. Um, I'm not as big a fan of that. I'm working on a custom solution just because I want to be able to know not only that this one is busy, but another one isn't. So if I didn't have six queues that were overwhelmed, it's not trying to ramp up too much. Another really simple way to get going is to simplify similar tasks. And with Celery, we can utilize abstract tasks. It just serves as a base class for new talk task types. And you can add custom handlers to respond to events for those similar types of tasks. It's useful for sharing boilerplate code, such as a database connection, or that's actually how I do my Celery mutex. So here's an example of a custom abstract class. First, you see that all you have to do is import Celery task, make that your parent class, and then abstract equals true. Abstract equals true. Then you just set up a property. In this case, I wanted to be able to access it if it's already connected. Go ahead and use that one, otherwise build a new one. And then I added on an after failure. If it failed, I want an email to let me know that this task failed. And then here's an example of you, you calling it. So you use base equals debug task. And then the get data.db is actually utilizing the DB to get the information that we need. Next, data, data everywhere. So there's all this data flowing around, and you need to be able to manage the data that you've got coming in. What's happening with your tasks? Where is that happening? Um, all your logging, all your errors. And so this is just kind of looking at some ways to help you manage all the data that you've got flowing around whenever you're dealing with distributed computing. First, keeping track of tasks. Install just the pre-baked monitoring tools. For Celery, this Celery Flower. This allows you just to see what tasks are running right now, what tasks have run recently. You can kind of get some charts to see how well the system is performing, when it's been really peak periods and not. And it's just an easy to install tool, because it's just a pip install away, to be monitoring your tasks. If you're using RabbitMQ, use RabbitMQ Management Plugin. This lets you see how many items are in the queue, lets you look over time at how your queue's been doing, and this just kind of helps you get an idea. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a call from someone on our floor saying, hey, I submitted this job and I haven't seen it yet. I fire it up and go, oh, the queue's got 400 items in it. Just wait a few minutes. Or I can look at it and go, man, I, my, the queue's empty, so I need to research where the problem was if an error message hadn't come across. Understand seller events and snapshots, or whatever tool you're using should have a way to snapshot and respond to events. So you can just keep track and customize for your needs, hey, here's what's happening at any given moment in your system. Hook into monitoring tools. If you've got Nagios, hook into it. If you've got Zabbix, uh, I've actually helped author a tool called RabbitMQ Zabbix that will monitor the queue if things have been idle too long or if you're running out of memory on that server or any type of thing like that. It'll send you an alert just so you can keep aware of what's going on. Next, logging. I can't tell you how much time I've wasted whenever I've got a problem that didn't respond, create an error, but I just need to figure out why it was behaving differently than we expected. Log into server A, look through the logs. Did I find it? No. Log out of server A, log into server B. Th is it here? No. And keep going until I find the problem, because I didn't properly, A, know where it was running using the tools that were available, speaking of some of those previous tools, but also just not having a central place. So, it, so save your fingers. Find a system that you trust. If you want to use Logstash to help you get something into a centralized system, if you want to use Heka to get something into a centralized system, use Elasticsearch, use Syslog, use NFS mount. OK, probably not that one. But find some way that you can keep your logs easy to view in a centralized place so that you can know what's going on. Related to that is error tracking. I like to keep 
a logging system and an error tracking system separate, just so that when an error happens, I've got an email that tells me everything that I need to, to know. So I use a centralized uh, error logger. I use Sentry, and I know those guys are here. But if you don't use Sentry, just use something. Find some way to keep track of the problems that you're having in your system so you can respond appropriately. And also leverage logger adapter to capture extra info. For especially Sentry, it allows you to pass in extra information that they can show up in your error report that can help you really quickly identify problems. You can get such things as host name, worker name. So here's an example of one that I've got that takes advantage of logger adapters, you can see here. I've got my extra information. DMS is a dealer management system. That's what I work with every day. And I want to know the company, the enterprise, the start URI, and the process path that was associated with the error. And then the tags I want to be able to filter on are the enterprise and company. And then we just pass that into our Git logger. So here's an example of what Sentry shows me. If you look towards the bottom under the blue tags, you might have a hard time seeing it at the back, but it says company PO1, enterprise POTC, level error, logger root, and server name CDAC24. So I knew right away where the problem lied. It was on CDAC24 and what company was affected. And then if you saw that DMS specific information, you see that now showing up under additional information. So not only do I know what company was affected, but I know exactly where to find the files that were affected and to be able to go on from there. So this is just a great way to be able to keep track of whenever problems happen. Next, testing, 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 testing. I'm not going to get that sweaty and I'm not going to go that long. So a testing strategy. This is just a personal testing strategy that I've developed whenever I've been working on distributing computing. Just kind of learned from the ropes of how I best find to build tasks so that whenever I do get to production and I'm ready to push it out, I'm not having to worry as much about throwing up errors. First, test outside of Celery. Your tasks should be able to stand alone from whatever task queue you're going to be working with. When I was first getting started, I tried conflating the two, and I was getting errors, and I just couldn't figure out what the problem was. Was it with my Celery setup, or was it with my, ta I mean, with my code itself? So just go ahead and make it freestanding so that you can call it outside of Celery to make sure everything's going OK. Next, test with a single worker. So go ahead and fire up Celery, but just run one worker. So send something across. Make sure that it receives it and processes it. This just makes sure you didn't do something wrong with Celery. As you've been working with Celery more or with whatever tool you're using more, you can probably get to the point where you bypass this step. But especially early on, it's really good to separate those two and just try it one at a time to make sure you aren't encountering problems with your setup. Next, test with one, test with one worker that has multiple concurrent jobs. This is just when we start to see, are there any problems with stuff running simultaneously? Maybe some race conditions, maybe some bad assumptions. And then I start to test with multiple servers. And this is when I really start to see, am I having some race conditions or am I making some assumptions, like I said, with that one file, two tasks, to where you've got data saved in the wrong place. Ramp up as much as possible. It's not always possible if you've got 400 servers that are doing your production work to be able to do that in your testing environment. But if you can do two, four, eight, that can just really help you try to identify, especially race conditions that you may not be able to find otherwise. So just to look at a couple of race conditions that I've found through this testing. So I had this process that goes over a directory and does this magic.import data delay, takes a file name, and it has this little clean equals true. Well, what it ended up doing was that as soon as it finishes the file, it deletes it from the start path. So can you imagine what happened the second time this job fired? If one had already been running and got that first file and said, oh, this is in the lister, by the time it got to that file on the second one, it was telling me, file not found. I couldn't figure out why, because the deletion was happening in a separate program. Finally realized it's because I'm deleting a file, but assuming that my OS list R is going to be accurate at the moment that the file is seen, which isn't always true. And so all I had to do was add in a try accept was my first solution to it. Another example is, I made a call to the database. I, it gave me a path where the file could be found on its file system. And then I did some transformations on it. And I kept getting these weird, it was XML, so it was doing XML transformation. I kept getting these weird invalid XML exceptions. And I could not figure out what was going on. So it turns out the culprit was the report path was actually just a file name using the date timestamp. And it only had a resolution of one second. 
So once I started spinning up to 16 and 24 jobs trying to do the same exact thing and call the same exact create report procedure, it was just writing data simultaneously and just putting whatever it could wherever it could. It didn't care. And so once I finally looked into it, there wasn't a way to change the stored procedure, unfortunately, because the database we used didn't have a higher granularity to it. And so I just added in a, a lock on it, a distributed lock using Zookeeper to make sure that only one of these executed at a time. I didn't mind keeping it celery because there's a lot of other work that could be done parallel if well, I'm not waiting on that specific lock, so I could still do the transformation and some other work. So I didn't mind it being in celery. I just want to make sure where I knew it was a dangerous place to make sure I didn't have any problems. Serenity Prayer. If you're not familiar with the Serenity Prayer, it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Sometimes when we're doing distributed computing, there are things that we can change and we should try to, and there are things that we can't change, and we just need to know how to work around it. So the first area is handling abusive tasks. Not all tasks are created equal. Just a few weeks ago, we took a process that was taking the worked in serial and it would build up an expect file and run it. And so I had no control over it because the system already existed and it was pretty complex. We didn't want to convert it to Python. And so I just, they basically said, stick it in a celery and make it work. Well, it seemed to work great in small level testing, but once we started ramping it up, we started encountering problems with it. And so one of the first things I learned was watch the memory usage. We weren't we were assuming that it was just going to give us a little bit of data back. It was overwhelming me with data getting put on standard out. I wasn't reading it, and so the buffer just kind of went, to heck with it, I'm done. <laughs> and so the process would lock up. So you can incrementally read the output. I didn't learn from my own slides about using iterators and reading over time, but we did. And then secondly, is just segregate it into its own queue. If you know a task may lock up from time to time and you really have an easy way to fix that, especially if it's something that you're calling outside, separate it into its own queue. Because if you don't, that one could lock up all of your tasks and then you're sitting here not doing any other jobs because the system is locked up trying to process something it can't handle. So that's a really simple way to just make sure you're not getting overwhelmed. Now, on that same vein, you also should utilize soft and hard timeouts in Celery. Soft timeout allows you to do some cleanup, maybe you want to delete some files, and then the hard timeout just kills without remorse. So here's an example of my abusive job. The first thing I want to point out is that I do a soft time limit. If this one takes an hour, go ahead and just, let's kill it. It throws an exception, the soft time limit exceeded, and for my environment, I go ahead and retry it a, a few times. I go with the default three, because sometimes it's just, for whatever reason, it locked up that one time, but if it gets a chance to try it later, it may work. And then, if I hit the max, I go ahead and send an email saying, this one failed, we're done. So this way, you just aren't locking up your system, waiting for something that's never going to come back. Single points of failure. First, identify your single points of failure. Everyone's got them. They're somewhere in your system. It could be your database. You just have a centralized database. It could be your broker. Oops, sorry. It could be your broker. You just have one computer doing your RabbitMQ. Eliminate the ones that you can. For RabbitMQ, go ahead and put it in a cluster. For us, we have a cluster of five servers that are doing just RabbitMQ and then five servers that are just doing Zookeeper so that I make sure that if one server goes down, you can say I need a list of servers to work with. You can just move on to the next one, and it's not going to affect your system. Another is if you can do database slaves. Sometimes you can do read-only slaves. Maybe you're fortunate enough to be able to use something like React or RethinkDB and utilize a system that's more distributed. And then if you can't eliminate them, just mitigate those that you can't. Add a pre-run check. So our database, until recently, had a really bad problem because it was five years behind on software updates. And we've grown enough as a company that it was pushing the limits of the database, and it would just throw its hands up and say, I'm done. And it would have anywhere from 30 seconds to about five minutes that it just was unreachable. We just said it was taking little siestas. Um, and so we had to learn, you know, do something really stupid simple. Put a pre-check in. If I can reach the database, go ahead and process. Yes, that can get into problems, but this can be a real quick way to say, I'm not even going to try it if I can't get to my database. 
Secondly, utilize retries. Don't assume that if that pre-check passes, that when you get to the next step, the database won't go down. Go ahead and do some try accepts, and if you need to, put them in retries or send emails or do some way of notifying you that you know that there's a problem. Just know that you've got these single points of failure and be ready to respond whenever they give you problems. Clock synchronization. Remember that clocks may differ. Do install NTP, but do not assume that they're still in sync. I had one where it was, we had a clock synchronization problem in our company. So we had a task that started at the beginning of the hour, and all it did was go and find all the reports for that hour and send them to our clients. And what it did was it started off and said, if there's not a time, just go ahead and do date time now, get the hour associated with it, and find the reports that go with it. Date time dot, date time dot now turned out to be really bad because what was happening was server A said it was 3 o'clock and created a task. That task was picked up by server B that was at 3 minutes earlier. So we wake up one morning and all the reports from 4 o'clock ran, 5 o'clock didn't, 6 o'clock ran, 7 o'clock didn't. And I'm sitting here looking at logs going, from the database point of view, everything ran. And I don't understand what's happening then I realized we're actually spamming our clients. So 4 o'clock got ran at 4 and 5 o'clock, and then 6 and 7 o'clock ran the 6 o'clock hour because I was using date time dot date time dot now on the server that was running the task, not the one that started the job. So the simple solution was I just added in the time so that whenever the other one receives it, it didn't care what time it was in its world. It just went ahead and said, oh, you told me it's 5 o'clock. I'll get my work done. Finally, we're calling in the Calvary. So these are just some more advanced ways to handle distributed computing to make your lives a little bit easier. First, limiting jobs. So a client calls you and says, you're hammering our servers. What are you going to do? This one happened to me was that <clears throat> we make a call out to the DMS, like I said, the dealer management system, and we just made a call to a single URL, and then they gave us data back. We all assumed that it just was one centralized server for them. But what turns out happens is that they're just a gateway. And so I send them this request, which has a code in it, and then they send it actually to the dealership. Dealerships can be cheap people, if you haven't noticed. And so some of them have really, really old hardware. And so they just couldn't handle the volume of requests that we were trying to do to get the data as quickly as possible. So what did I do? I implemented a Zookeeper distributed semaphore. This just allowed me to set the number of leases, based on that code, what we call the DMS code, and then can be tuned to our specific need. So here's the code that I did. I actually had my existing task, and all I did was add on a context manager to it for a semaphore. And the key pieces here are if there's a DMS code, because there may not be one, so I don't want to assume it, and if I'm not calling it directly, because I want to cheat. I don't want to have to wait if someone else has already used up all of my semaphore leases. Call a semaphore with a max number of leases of three. If I'm able to acquire it, go ahead. Otherwise, I don't want to block because I could be working on another dealership that's on a different DMS code and just throw it into the retry queue, to, or throw it back into the queue with a retry so that I can work on it later. Next, thundering herd. Occurs when a large number of processes waiting for an event are awoken when that event occurs, but only one process is able to proceed at a time. Generally with a queue, that's not too much of a problem when you're using RabbitMQ, but what I was noticing, especially with that database call before where I was calling the same report and they were getting overwritten, a lot of them would hit the same time, and then only one would be able to pick up the lock, and then so if there's 20 of them, then 19 would all wake up right about the same time and try to process it. So I'm like, this is a waste of resources when I know I can't do them all the exact same time. So what I did was just add a little jitter to the retries. So I just made my countdown random between 30 to 60 seconds. It usually took about 15 seconds to do the database, but I gave myself a little leeway. And so this was good enough just to make sure that I could keep processing other tasks instead of just wasting time, keep retrying, when I knew everything was trying to do the same thing and going to retry again. It's simple, but it was effective. You can also utilize Zookeeper locks. This adds complexity, but it's arguably more correct because lo locks are held in a list, so what happens is as soon as the first one finishes, it only notifies the next one, and so on and so on. But that causes you also to do blocking. If you're okay with that, go for it. 
Otherwise, I just like cheating and going with a little jitter. A distributed mutex. A mutex is a way to ensure that no two concurrent processes are running at the same time. For our needs, we had a lot of jobs that are just running once every minute. And generally, they happen really fast. But sometimes, one job could take too long. It could take five minutes, six minutes. And what was happening is we were stacking up the queue with jobs that were going to do the exact same thing and just, again, kind of wasting our resources. And so what I've done is I wrote a distributed mutex that only starts it if the current one isn't running. So it just checks and says, is there already one doing this work? Fine, I'll let it finish this job and move on. And I wrote it to where it can be limited by the input type. So we'll look at some examples. So here's what the code is that does this mutex. Again, I can take advantage of using a context manager. But the, the key is this get node. So it cycles over the arguments that come in on the task. You say which ones you want, builds up the mutex. And then if the client doesn't exist, you've succeeded because you don't have the lock, creates the lock, yields back saying, yes, I got the lock, and I have the mutex, otherwise false. So here's how it actually looks in the code. So this is using the abstract task. I'm actually overriding apply a sync in Celery. So what this is is whenever you first try to start a task and a call apply a sync, it gets the mutex. If it's actually required, because remember I've got a return value, then I go ahead and process. Otherwise, I just skip it and move on. And then the after return, remember those signals and handlers I talked about? This allows me to, whenever a task finished actually running, this signal is fired, the lock node is acquired, and then if it exists, we go ahead and delete it. And so here's an example. Oops. Here's an example of how I used it. Remember me talking about iterating over or listening over the directory and having that clean equals true and giving me problems? The better solution I had was just put it in a mutex task because one's only going to be running at a time. And if it started the job, it's already passed it off, and so we're good to go. And so this allowed me to just have a really simple solution for iterating over my folder. Another example is building exports. I wanted to be able to say, if it's got a certain schedule ID, only one run at a time. But our export builder can run one schedule, two, three, four, five. Those aren't going to be conflicting. But I just want to make sure only one on a certain schedule ID runs at a time. So this allowed me to filter that down. And so last is the most important question. Are we there yet? Yes. Congratulations. You've survived my talk. I hope that you're able to learn from my mistakes. It was a, it's been challenging, but it's been rewarding also to, to do everything that I've been able to do. Do I regret switching from just having stuff run on one subvert to multiple? No, I think it's incredible the potential that it unlocks. But also be diligent. Just last Friday, I released some code into production. We were having a problem. I didn't test it thoroughly, and I introduced a deadlock. So I woke up Saturday morning to a bunch of server emails complaining about problems. I was at a garage sale, and so I had to log on to my phone and try to fix it. Didn't fix it very well, so then I came into the office on Monday morning and had to fix it again. So just be diligent. Don't think, oh, I've got this figured out. Just, that's why I have that list of fallacies of distributed computing in my office as a reminder to be diligent. And please ask questions. I would love to answer any of your questions. If you've got them now, we'll do a time of questions. But in the hallway, at lunch, over drinks, my time can be bought with cream sodas. I originally said I can be bought with cream sodas and kind of thought that one through. <laughs> and also, feel free to get in touch. You can find me on Twitter, at Brother Lewis. My email address is lewis.franklin at gmail.com. And then my website is brotherlewis.com. And are there any questions? So um, I'm about to implement a distributed system at work. Um, one thing that I'm particularly worried about is disappearing jobs or duplicated jobs. How often do those show up, have you found? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Disappearing jobs, really, if you've written your system well, it really hasn't been too much of a problem. But that's also where making sure you've got the tools and doing those snapshots really helps keep you safe. A lot of our stuff already had existing database infrastructure for keeping track. 
So just figure out a way to keep track of it. As far as duplicated, um, that's where I, you saw me start using that mutex was because I was seeing stuff duplicated, and that was just a cheat way to make sure it wasn't duplicated. And that you can get to at Celery under mutex on PyPy and start using that today. Okay. When you were talking about testing, you said like you know scale up over time, like mm -hmm. go from no Celery worker to multiple Celery or single Celery worker, et cetera, et cetera. Doing those tests in isolation, sure, unit test framework is wonderful, but once you turn on a Celery worker, are you using any other tools to automate that testing, or is this mostly kick off some Jenkins job and then check the output manually? Um, ideally, it could be and should be something else. The company I work for, I'm the only Python developer. Um, I'm a PHP shop that trying to show them the light. <laughs> and so a lot of it is very manual. Um, can you find other ways to better handle that? Sure. When I just have a list this long of things that need to be improved in our system, I just don't have the time to do that. I have a question. Did you meet the problem when the time is changing? Uh, for example, the uh, specific hour during the day is not uh, available, or there is one hour that is twice a day, you know? Right. Um, so, like, time change and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, I didn't specifically plan for that, but our system was up to date enough it didn't bite me. But yes, that, that is a concern. Um, some distros do have a problem where whenever they do time change can say, repeat the same exact time. Um, and actually, that scheduled reports that we were doing wasn't installed yet, so uh, that's a good point. I will probably have a better answer for that in a few months whenever the time changes again. I'm going, dang it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, servers on UTC is an excellent example. We don't do that, and we should. Um, so that's a great, great suggestion from the audience. Uh, yes. Hey. Uh, I just, uh, I've used SendGrid Engine in the past, and I just started using Celery, and I'm really missing a QStat like monitoring tool. Uh, which of the ones you mentioned is closest to that? Or are you familiar? To which tool? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, QStat, which is for SendGrid Engine. If you aren't familiar, that's fine. I'm not, unfortunately. Right. Uh, yeah, so it's something for keeping track of the, the tasks that are running right now and how long each of them took. And th that's what Celery Flower is supposed to be for, I thought, but maybe I just set it up wrong. <laughs> Celery Flower should be for that. Um, you kind of have to step through it to get there. So like when you first log in, it'll show you the lists of tasks or of workers that are running. If you click on that, there's another tab that shows the tasks that are currently running. And it'll show currently running, what is queued, and stuff like that. So you can't, I, in my experience, that's where I usually can go and drill down. Um, if that doesn't answer your question, please grab me afterwards and see if I can understand what you have better <laughs> to, or have used to find a better solution. Thanks. No problem. Um, so uh, you mentioning PHP actually um, brought up another question. Um, I'm also having to integrate the. Um, integrate this from a PHP application. Um, do you guys do anything for PHP interop with Celery, or do this PHP and Python worlds stay pretty separate? No, they don't. And actually, something I didn't talk about because it was kind of tangential, but would be applicable to you is I actually wrote a little Flask app that's just a web app that's sitting there, and you go to slash tasks, and it lists all of my Celery tasks that are available, and then you can do that slash task, task name that you get back and call it. And so that's how we do the interaction. In theory, you can use JSON and stick it in a RabbitMQ, but uh, our operations didn't want to install the RabbitMQ lib, so that's why I just threw up a little Flask helper. If you'd be interested in something like that, I would be happy to try to get that code to you so you could utilize it. Okay. Because it's uh, fairly independent. Okay. And Another question, um, how many daemons do you have floating around in production to coordinate all these things? Like um, RabbitMQ, Zookeeper, sure. anything else? So I've got five servers, and I kind of fudge a little bit. I have five servers that do both Zookeeper and RabbitMQ, and so I've got those five machines working, doing that, and they're beefy enough that they just do that and move on. I have never had a problem once I set those up independently. As a side note, make sure you do put those on separate machines <laughs> if you don't. It, you can get into troubles because your queues can overwhelm your RabbitMQ. Um, and then we just use, right now, four different servers that are actually doing the work. But as we continue to grow our business, we just can throw up a new server and get going from there. Um, and on that uh, similar note, make sure you, you know, you're utilizing tools to make server distribution easy. Right now, we're in the middle of converting from shell scripts I wrote to make a new server to salt. 
but just, you know, if you can have a way to automate a server and spin them up real quick, or if it's giving you problems, just destroy it, instead of worrying about babysitting a server. Any other questions? Well, thanks again for letting me speak to each and every one of y'all, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your conference. And like I said, please feel free to get in touch. I've got cards as well, if I didn't leave my information up there soon enough, or long enough. So thank you, and have a great conference. Thank you.